Well, good morning, everyone, and and thank you, as always, for um, uh, for joining us. Um, we've done um, a Robert Lowell poem before, and for the Union Dad, which was really one of his most public poems. And this is really one of his most personal poems. So, um, ah, good morning. Good morning. Um, and um, uh, let me read it. And then we can... We actually, Ted, you 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 sent me a brief email that I thought was very eloquent. Did, did did you find it? Do you have it that you could read it to us? I do have it. Maybe let's hear it before I read the poem. Thank you for choosing this devastatingly brilliant poem. Its astonishing craft is one thing. But the being you are when you leave the page is the being you weren't when you started. I'm a mess of tell it like it is sadness. After I read it a fourth time, why did I think of even here, Bishop? Who better to ask this question <laughs> of? Um, thank you. Um, thank you. Uh, I, I I asked you to read it because it's so much. I, I I respond so much to to what my response to the poem is so parallel to yours, so similar to yours that I feel different that I feel different at the end at the end of the poem than I than I did at the beginning of the poem. Um, so waking in the blue, the night attendant, a BU sophomore rouses from the mare's nest of his drowsy head, propped on the meaning of meaning. He catwalks down our corridor. Azure day makes my agonized blue window bleaker. Crows maunder on the petrified fairway. Absence, my heart grows tense as though a harpoon were sparring for the kill. This is the house for the mentally ill. What use is my sense of humor? I grin at Stanley, now sunk in his sixties, once a Harvard All-American fullback, if such were possible, still hoarding the build of a boy in his twenties, as he soaks a ramrod with the muscle of a seal in his long tub, vaguely urinous from the Victorian plumbing. A kingly granite profile in a crimson golf cap. Worn all day, all night, he thinks only of his figure, of slimming on sherbet and ginger ale, more cut off from words than a seal. This is the way day breaks in Bowditch Hall at McLean's. The hooded night lights bring out Bobby, for Sally in 29, a replica of Louis XVI without the wig, redolent and roly-poly as a sperm whale, as he swashbuckles about in his birthday suit and horses at chairs. These victorious figures of bravado, ossified young. In between the limits of day, hours and hours go by under the crew haircuts and slightly too little nonsensical bachelor twinkle of the Roman Catholic attendants. There are no Mayflower screwballs in the Catholic Church. After a hearty New England breakfast, I weigh 200 pounds this morning. Cock of the walk, 
I strut in my turtleneck French sailor's jersey before the metal shaving mirrors and see the shaky future grow familiar in the pinched indigenous faces of these thoroughbred mental cases. Twice my age and half my weight. We are all old timers. Each of us holds a locked razor. Uh, well, what's your, do, 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 do any of the rest of you feel what, what Ted and I do about really feeling different feeling like a almost like a different person at the end of the poem different from the way we felt at the at the beginning selena welcome yes welcome 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 nice uh, to see you nice to see you lloyd thank you for your book it's beautiful the translations are just oh. a, a piece of art oh thank you oh that's very nice i, I need you to sign it for me i i would love to do that this poem is so heartbreaking for me can you can you talk a little more about about I, that I, I i'm i'm not sure i am qualified to talk about it because oh, please. Of course there's not. There, there are so many images. I mean, that, I mean, it's not from my background, but I'm sure there are meanings in those images. Mm -hmm. And when I first read this poem, I said, I can't miss this session because I need to understand it. Okay. And put some meaning in, because even without understanding a lot of things that are here that I know they have a meaning. It just takes you out of your, your let's say, routine, common life, brings you outside somewhere. Are you so, are you in Brazil? No, I I'm in Chicago now. Oh, okay. <laughs> I'm visiting my son that lives, Carlos, that you know. Oh, he lives nice. here now. Oh, in Chicago. Wow. Yes, he. Well, I'm glad you're in the States and it's really, it's very nice to see you. And, yes. and maybe we have a chance to see, let's talk after the session. Okay. Thank you for starting us off. Yes. Abrazos. Um, uh, well, any, anyone else wants Wait, to? It looks like Robin wants to speak. Oh, oh yes, please. I can't, oh, there you are. I I um I feel nervous starting with this, but I'm going to go ahead and start it. Hey, Robin. Hi, Hi. Gail. Uh, for me, this poem uh, encapsulates the kind of tragic end of white patriarchal privilege of white <laughs> men. And uh, even though even I have nostalgia for the white patriarchal privilege of white men as a Jewish lesbian, uh, for me, the poem really uh, shows the kind of structural collapse of that world. Uh, and it does so with these particulars, like uh, the Porcellian Club, which, you know, was an anti-Semitic final club at Harvard for since 1791. Uh, <laughs> and uh, the the references to Victoriana and the plumbing and the uh, and though I love the the sad humor, sparring for the kill and the mentally ill, um, the line that moves me the most is the single stanza line, these victorious figures of bravado ossified young. And in that word victorious, I also hear Victorian. Um, yeah. Uh, all, all the specifics are powerful. The snobbery between the Episcopalians and the Catholics, uh, the the meaning of meaning 
also a tongue in cheek, uh, the Uranus plumbing. Uh, okay, that's that's my contribution for the morning. <laughs> um, what do you what do you know about? Um, I just oh well, I just um, I was going to oh yeah here here it is. I was going <coughs> to read I was going to read you something. Do, what do you know about the meaning of meaning? That it's a anyway. book of a book of philosophy and linguistics and... and linguistics. Yeah, I just I was just looking at this is the very heavy collected <laughs> poems of Robert Lowell, um, and which has wonderful notes in it. And uh, I was just checking the notes, and um, apparently in um, in a draft of the poem. It says, uh, a draft of this poem used instead of the meaning of meaning, semantics and social relations. <laughs> so that was Lo that was Lowell's uh, first joke, and mm -hmm. then A anyone ever read the meaning of meaning? <laughs> Karen, aha. Can oh, you you're muted, you? Karen. Nope, still muted. Okay, unmute. Here it goes. I started by saying some of you may recognize the name of Reuben Brower, with whom I studied, and probably you did too, Lloyd. Um, anyway, you had to read the meaning of meaning or know about it because it was the approach to how you read poetry and a very serious look at the poem as a poem, the language of the poem, very careful. How was it threaded? How would it put together? So when I first read the poem, Waking in the Blue, my first thought was impatience. I thought, why didn't you just write a story? Because it seemed like an anti-poem and that he was sort of deliberately not using what I would have thought of as something lyrical or poetic. It sounded to me like a story that someone would write. He rouses propped up, he catwalks down, or crows maunder. Okay, maybe we can start bringing in the natural world or something, but that you could do in a prose piece too, in a story about this place. Um, the first time that I felt any um, anything beside exactly what Robin was saying about this snarky classism here, the the way wasp ha wasps have of deflating themselves while maintaining their knowledge of their superiority and your knowledge of their superiority. So is that funny place in that tone? But other than that, when I saw the single line, these victorious figures of bravado ossified young. The resonances are not just sarcastic at these guys who are not victorious, including Louis the Sixteenth, uh, but they struck me as statues of Civil War soldiers. And I'm thinking of Lowell and for the Union dead, who died young, victorious figures of bravado and bravado. And now he's not being so nasty because maybe not for me, because I got these different um, ref resonances that had nothing to do with these mentally ill people that uh, he's both satirizing and semi-sympathizing with, identifying with. Um, and um, this is, these are Bobby from Porcelain in 29. I mean, these are his people, not only just that they're mentally unsound, um, but they're, so the tone is very confusing probably the ambivalence that he would have towards where he was mm. 
and those who were there with him and what happened to them, what happened to all of them. And the only time I felt a complete tone shift, and I don't know if anybody else would agree with me, was the last line where it's a shock. And we're in different, we're in, I was in different territory at that point. Catherine? I would say the last two lines, actually. I, I think that until then, it's so dripping with contempt for each and everything that he sees, starting with BU. <laughs> and starting with, <laughs> oh, well. And second, oh, and second it's, it's only a paycheck. It's only a paycheck. And second, and second with sophomore. <laughs> oh, and starting with night attendant. I mean, who works in a... Yeah. So everything that he encounters, every individual, he regards with contempt. With respect to poetry, your point, uh, didn't you feel you were in a poem when you read Azure Day makes my agonized blue window bleaker? That the window yeah. is agonized. Um, yeah. But, yeah. but you're right about and, that. I, that, I then, think that I, I felt I was in poetry both in the way his line went and and also different tone connotations there in the long line vaguely uranus from the victorian plumbing i yeah. mean the assonance throughout is so good and then this, this the alliteration i mean i feel he's he's thinking about writing maybe but, laughing writing a very poetic line <laughs> But but um, I, I just about contempt. I want to go on about contempt about his contempt for each of the other patients for the night attendant and then each of the other patients. But to me, at in that last two lines, you see that it, the contempt, the deepest contempt is for himself, or more deeply than that, more deeply than contempt, I would say, the self loathing mm. that what he's been. That we are all, you know, I'm one of them. We are all, and we're all patients. We all cannot be trusted with an open razor. And that retroactively changes what has been contempt mm -hmm. for other people. We have yes. um, a couple people waiting yeah. to jump in. Jennifer uh, is there, and then Ellen and um, Jim. I, I just I just wanted to say a little about the um the BU attendant for whom I guess I I feel more sympathy and that uh the title of the poem Waking in the Blue I I like that we start with this figure who is who is half awake and and even the kind of tangle of the description and the sounds as Lloyd made clear uh, when he read it, you know, rouse, mare's nest, drowsy, there's kind of a buzzing. And in this, even the strange notion that you wouldn't just rouse your drowsy head from a book you were reading, but rouse the mare's nest of your drowsy head from the book you were reading. It seems to me the poem there's just a general point that the poem starts with a kind of um, muddled half waking. And then by the end, the, the most awake, clear, distinct line that is, we are all old timers. Each of us holds a locked razor. So I guess that was two points, but it's, I, I, don't, I don't feel contempt at the beginning. I feel um, sympathy for, somebody working and not not working at two jobs, right? Reading the meaning of meaning and then the night job is working at this place. And I guess um, I've done things like that and known people who've done things like that. So didn't feel contempt. Oh, so have I, I was just locating it in the context of the other references that have been picked up with me. Uh, John, Jonathan, you had your hand up and then Ellen, Ellen and Jim. I, I just think it's a mistake to approach, for, for me, to, to approach his descriptions of these uh, his fellow patients as being contemptuous. Uh, uh, 
know, it's painful, um, but I think it's 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 entirely sympathetic. It's not expecting these people to be something other than what what, he, what he's seeing. I, I just think contempt is is misplaced. That's all. Uh, Ellen and then Gail. It's, it's oh, Jim. Be, yeah. It's be Jim. Yeah. I mean, to me, this is obviously a Harvard poem uh, <laughs> with uh, including the BU reference uh, and the meaning of meaning, which I had to read too when, when I was learning about uh, how to read poetry. Uh, it's I.A. Richards, I believe, right? Uh, and, I.A. Richards, yeah. Uh, um, and um, I, 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 I don't feel anything except uh, uh, a sort of continued takedown of the glory that, that quote was Harvard and all these people, including himself. I mean, there's, uh, you know, there's no uh, more uh, famous name in, uh, you know, America than Lowell. Uh, and uh, it, it, it just shows, I think, line after line of life, what you know what the reality is behind those names at at least at this point mm. uh i mean i've been in been in mclean uh you know mclean is another you know it's a harvard way station as well but it's you know with a lock razor it's you know it's the end of the line and i think it makes it very clear sort of the end of line and the the pain of that of once was uh, and uh, the sadness that goes with it. Gail and then Mary. I, I just always felt, and I felt it more this morning, Look, I hadn't read this poem in a couple of years, hmm. that he was one of them. He wasn't, it wasn't just his class. They were all patients at McLean, and that was uh, desperate and extreme. And so I actually don't agree that it's contemptuous so much as almost like an extension of the self-loathing that he was experiencing. And what he could do that they couldn't do was write this poem, which he probably wrote afterwards. Mm -hmm. You know, I mean, it's so, it's so, uh, contained and and uh you know there's nothing out of control about this poem but it went and his when he comes to his description of himself after a hearty new england breakfast i weigh 200 pounds that was a lot of of pounds i mean he was probably hating his body as well as everything else at that time and then mocking himself i'm self-aggrandizing i'm cock of the walk you know, in my turtleneck French sailor sweater, which is, I'm absurd. It, you know, it's all in the, in the um, he, he's together with them. And I'm not saying that he's kind or, you know, that, but that what use is my sense of humor? And his sense of humor comes out constantly, even on himself, but it, it doesn't really make you laugh. Yeah. You know? Mary and then Nick. Hmm? Oh, hi. yeah, I, I, I love what I just, uh, yeah, Gail, I love what you just said. The extension of self-loathing is, that that's a great way of saying what I've been feeling. But yeah, I wanted to chime in um, about um, the empathy and the deep feeling for these uh, characters. It seems to me that the kind of mocking quality goes hand in hand with um, a really deeply sympathetic, almost like a piercing of everyone's failure. Um, and the ossified young suggests, you know, like um, I think uh, Karen said, you know, there's a statuesque quality, but there's also a sense that there is no future to go into that for these people, the end happens really early. Uh, and I, I wanted to add one more thing in terms of the, um, 
I mean, we it's I guess it's at the very end that we we get an articulation of a we that that he's really um he's one of them, these people that he's been kind of mocking, but also I think very sympathetic toward um but um but they're they've also been presented as forms of animals throughout the poem, right? We have seals and and um God, I wrote I wrote some down. Oh, the roly poly sperm whale is the most, yeah. I mean, it's just just amazing. We have the mare's I yeah, to me, the mare's nest of that sophomore that, that's where the sympathy is. I mean, empathy, but it's where he connects. You wouldn't you wouldn't <clears throat> say the mare's nest of his head unless you were somehow identifying with it or relating to it. But anyway, I thought the animal. The use of animals in this poem was just terrific. And um, anyway, I just love it. Oh, good. Thank you, Nick. And then um, uh, Denise. OK, well, I had several points uh, that I hope are somehow uh, connected, although I think the poem is fiendishly complex uh, because you don't know who the narrator is, except it must be Lowell. And uh, he is there as a patient. And the last few years of his life, he was in and out of the clans almost constantly. And so uh, he is seeing what's happening to the others who are already there. And, uh, but I think also protesting, just, I mean, I think that waking in the blue immediately, I thought of, uh, Oscar Wilde and the Ballad of Reading Jail with the line, uh, that patch of blue we prisoners call the sky. The mm. conditions in these institutions were horrendous. And I, I don't think you can read the poem without understanding it. It's just, it is a social, it is partly social protest, I think. And also watching, he's very sympathetic to everyone else there and seeing how mental illness has frozen them in their tracks and seeing how it's maybe doing the very same thing to him. Yeah. That's sort of how I see it. Thank you. Denise? Thank you, yes. Um, I, I've, heard, I've heard a lot of thoughts that resonate with me. As far as the seals and the sperm whale, they're sea creatures which um, I think could be a reference to the blue that he's waking in. And then he notes in the last stanza that he's wearing a French sailor's jersey. So I think, I think that those references link these three patients. And I don't think he's contemptuous um, of them, except in so far as he is of himself but that he refers to them collectively as, um, well, there are the figures of bravado ossified young, but he then he refers to them as Mayflower screwballs and thoroughbred mental cases. Um, so, so that's definitely a, a reference to, to not, not just class, but pedigree. Um, and I think, I think there's a little bit of contrast with with the night attendant who's more, I don't know, proletarian. Um, and and that's that reminded me of that pound poem about the, the woman who's dying of a I don't know, dying of something and then she's contrasted with the the unkillable children of, of the poor. It's a very short poem. I'll see if I can find it on my shelf. Anyway, um, so those are my thoughts. Thanks. I, let me let me just interrupt because I I I'm I'm this the, the this conversation is so interesting, and it kind of reminds me of what was happening in the literary world when Lowell published Life Studies, which is the book that this poem is part of. 
and it's the their poems about his family and and um and and really what what it meant um it seemed at first personally for him to be part of this sort of american aristocracy although living on the wrong end of of beacon hill um and and the way this whole that whole world harvard and um the lowell family and even mclean's fit into yes. uh fit into a kind of a, a real it it's 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 a kind of preparation for the union dead that the larger political subject <clears throat> of his next book were all being prepared for in what was originally taken to be um you know con quote unquote confessional poetry that is just sort of his own kind of pouring out of his own feelings, which was just, you know, I, I think the, the book came to be understood, the whole book of poems in which Waking in the Blue was really one of the most shocking parts of, because nobody, really nobody had written a poem about what it was like to be in a mental hospital. And so there was, there was this kind of shock and and shock and awe, <laughs> uh, and that the discussion of life studies and waking in the blue was very complicated, and complicated in a way that's very similar <clears throat> to how this, you know, how our discussion today is is kind of is is playing out, and that I you know I would I would encourage. Everyone, I can't, I, I, I can't suggest that, you know, that we have a discussion of the whole book, but I encourage everyone to read the <clears throat> book because it, it, this poem is also, I think this poem brilliantly stands on its own, devastatingly, as Ted put it earlier, devastatingly stands on its own, but it's also part of a uh, part of a movement and and part of the movement is away from the sort of poetic language of of Lowell's own earlier book and that there was a kind of shock that he would have a, the mare's nest of his drowsy head in 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 a poem um and yet you look at the poem and you know catwalks as a verb um mare's nest of his drowsy head what he by the way is is everyone clear about or does everyone have an image of the mare's nest of his drowsy head what is what is that what do you see when you when you read those words anything tangles tangles yeah tangles Tangle. Now, the itself is an expression, right? You know, of of confusion and chaos and uh -huh. you know disorder. disorder. Right. But what are we? What are we looking at? Well, I would look at his hair is curly and it's all tangled, and he hasn't combed it or brushed it or fixed. Yeah, yeah he's been up all night. Yeah, so. Well, I think it's just he's like anyone who's been on a, a night watch, as many of us have. Uh, he fell asleep when he was reading this book. He was supposed to, he'd been assigned. Right. And of course, he's, his mind is tangled as anyone who is suddenly uh, awakened. And uh, he's, been a, he's been their night guard all night. And, and that's and another thing that same person did go on to graduate from BU and was there 20 years later when another patient came 
and uh, he had stayed. That was he made that his life, and he carried this poem around in his pocket. He would show to anybody because that was a high point of his life that Lola had written this poem mentioning him. Oh, so, I didn't know that. Oh, uh, <laughs> uh, wow. Um, uh, Bill, Bill Bennett. Uh, yeah. Um, you know, partly, um, this is just rephrasing what other people have said that it's, uh, it's a poem very much about shame and pride mm -hmm. and a gloss on the phrase, if you will, pride goeth before a fall. Mm -hmm. It's about being in a mental institution, but it's also about the particular kind of mental illness that he had. Waking in the blue could mean waking when I am now depressed. Uh, his bipolar disorder would have had him infinitely proud on the way into the hospital and quite likely quite blue on the way out of the hospital because that's the nature of it. So in part, I think he may be describing something of his own thought process or emotional process uh, as part of this hospitalization. Catherine? I grew up in a household where uh, two things were talked about, um, uh, Freudian psychiatry and biologic psychiatry. And <clears throat> this, at this time of the writing of this poem, uh, Freudian analysis was very much in fashion and people didn't necessarily understand that it was an illness. And there were certain symptoms like crazy talk and being depressed and ideation of suicide. And once upon a time, I was reading some um, uh, descriptions of uh, pe people who had psychiatric illness from a, from a Freudian point of view, and I found them very um, unsatisfying. There's a polite word. Um, and I've decided to make a course um, to, to understand what depression was, which would not come from a psychiatric textbook. And I made a list of things that I thought would I would use to, to, to show what a depression was and that it was an illness. And I think I had The Edge of Sadness by Edwin O'Connor and Mrs. Dalloway. This would go right, right there. Um, and it's a different take on that because partly it was how, and McLean from that time less so in the present, but certainly in that time, was recognized as a hospital that um, took care of people by income. And um, when your money ran out, so did you. Oh. And it was a sort of a terrifying, you know, it was very much non-biological psychiatry. That's polite. That's it. Anyway, that's a different take. But you you might re recognize that, Lloyd. Yeah. Yeah. About, and I think Thank you. All, all the all the animals are are wonderful, mm. um, and I wondered whether the all American full, full, fullback was one of them. <laughs> he perceived that in that list. Uh huh. I was. I just wanted to um, uh, go back for a second. Oh, Susan, but I just wanted to go back for a second to what Bill said uh, about the title, and and I also. Um, I always thought of the title at the blue in the title as a kind of out of the blue, you know, as something uh, unexpected and confusion, confusing and um, not so much feeling blue, but f in the, a kind of feeling of confusion, kind of dazed feeling of, you know, where am I? Um, but that's, that's how I, that's how I took that title. So, um, uh, Susan, ask about, oh, oh, Bill, ha hang on one second, but Susan, be you to it. Um, I have a very different feeling about the first verse, which I find, I find the poem devastating. It made me laugh and cry and I find it deeply disturbing because waking in the blue that azure sky while well, he is in agony and behind glass and um the 
petrified fair way the the I, that word petrified absence my heart doesn't go fonder it grows tense as though a harpoon were sparring for the kill and then this is the house for the mentally ill i just i just kept hearing that desperation in those those words and trapped behind glass has in an aquarium or whatever that the that the beauty of the azure sky could not penetrate his poetic self and then the question is what use is my sense of humor and then he proceeds to to create a world in which that in some way represents his healthy awareness of these people and of of looking at them in a humorous way and and um sympathizing with them and then i think as you all said wonderfully um his being cock of the walk imagining that he could be outside and on the riding the sea riding the azure blue outside of the trap of the enclosed windows and then suddenly pulling back into the the shake those indigenous faces thoroughbred picking up mare's nest for me twice my age half my weight we are all old timers each of us holds a locked razor it just i it just i find it devastating and and the opening agony isn't isn't solved for me by the by the sense of humor that perhaps is his poetic health healthy self in the fact that he can make a poem about this agony i'm sorry i talked too long but no 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 apology necessary thank you i i love this discussion um Belinda, oh, there's so many comments coming uh, up on the screen okay. and and also lisa has has been waiting and she oh, wanted to please, jump in thank you i can't i always see every um, but bill had actually bill had a, a he had his hand up at the same time that susan did so fair enough bill is bill symes is next oh okay thank Hi, you bill. lloyd um uh, i keep getting messages flashing up telling me my, that my internet connection is unstable so i may sort of black out at some point but um uh well the first thing i wanted to say was that it's it's very good to hear americans talk about this because you've been able to elucidate implications of lots of references which i think were lost on me i didn't realize that b oh no oh yeah the eu is yeah know, boston university with a certain contempt yeah, yeah, that that much I knew, but I didn't realize okay. that there was a kind of de Oumbach condescension uh, um, in, um, uh, when a sort of Harvard man uh, refers to BU. Um, uh, so that that was. I didn't yeah. know that McLean's was a particularly bosh um, madhouse, um, and I, I didn't know that Porcelian was a uh, um, uh, some kind of fraternity with um, anti-Semitic uh, um, leanings. So that, that, that was, that's was been good to learn all that. But I wanted to ask about a couple, which I think you've mentioned. The first was, I don't, um, uh, the, the, the blue window, um, the azure day make, making the agonized blue window bleaker. I'm just wondering why the window is blue in the first case. Uh, agonized seems to be, um, you know, a transferred epithet. It's high palace, isn't it? It's his be transferred onto the window that might include the blueness is also an, an emotional quality of his transferred onto the window because otherwise the window would would be whatever color the sky is outside so it would only so as you would make it blue it wouldn't make it um uh uh um uh is it it, 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 it would the, the window wouldn't be blue except in so far as it, it was an azure day outside 
if you see what I mean. Um, and the other word I wanted to, but then I think the conversation moved on. Is is there um, a, a note of disdain in that? Is he suggesting that the the night attendant is, um, I don't know, strutting or something, or it, it is um, when he walks down the corridor, um, no, uh, there's some kind of preening quality in his walk. No, I think he catwalks down the corridor. That seems. What, what do you mean? Like, do you mean like a cat? I was thinking a, a model on a catwalk. The fashion, fashion statement. Yes, yes, a fashion reference. It, so, it, so, it seems... a, so a model walks aware that all eyes are upon her and aware of her own beauty. Uh, is uh, it is so? Yeah, insofar as the and then cat walks down the corridor, is he not sort of um, uh, somewhat full of himself or something like that? I I I have a completely different take on that, but I'm wondering oh, oh, if anyone me. else has. I I um. Mary. Yeah, I wanted to say. I mean, I have a sense of um, I have a sense of someone working in you know the night shift, the what's called the graveyard shift. Um, one trying to be quiet, probably not wanting to, you know the. The better they sleep, the better I sleep, right? Or the more I can read this damn book or whatever it is that he's he's getting through that night. Um, but I also picture the um that that he may be somewhat unseen. And so he can be a little, you know, he can kind of do his that there, there could be a catwalk, you know, as a style thing, but also I, I think it blends the quiet, you know, the the trying to be quiet and not wake up the uh, the inmates. I don't know. It's, 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 it's mainly walking with, with the sort of stealth of a. But, but definitely, definitely is. that. Yeah, I ah, think definitely. Oh, I, 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 sort of, I think I'd missed that by jumping immediately to the the, the fashion catwalk. Yeah, I have to mm -hmm. say that never that never occurred to me okay. that I was thinking of. You know, I think of catwalks as you know backstage in a theater and and kind of precarious and narrow and you had to be quiet and but he's also you know he's checking up on on all the patients so that he's he's doing his job and he has to do it with some with some kind of stealth but also kind of care that he doesn't fall off um anyway that's uh, that, that, that's and, how and, i took it and and on the question of how the window is already blue so as to be yeah. then uh, altered by the azure day because well, right, you think that the blueness was product of the azure day sort of outside the window i wonder if again i i i i i, I took it in a in a in a in a completely different way um i mean and I and I'm wondering if anyone else has has a thought about the the mm -hmm. the, the, the azure blue the agonized blue window. Can we let Lisa chime in? Yes, please. Yeah, sorry. <laughs> I don't want to take us off track, but before a while back, Lloyd, you talked about how Robert Lowell was entering into a different form of poetry, into a confessional mode. And uh, we talked about McLean's as well. And of course, I'm thinking about Sylvia Plath, who was in and out of McLean's and Anne and, and Lowell student. Uh, yes, and, and Anne Sexton, and those both of them were in her in his class. Right. And I don't know actually if he led them down a confessional path or if they were already on it. But there's a sort of coming together of a blazing fury of those minds of Robert Lowell and. Sylvia Plath and Anne Sexton all in one room, all in one class, and also in one era doing confessional poetry. And two of those people ended up committing suicide. And one obviously came very close to it, Robert Lowell. And I wonder, I don't know, I guess I wanted to pose that question to everyone. If, if that exploration of self that came from confessional poetry somehow led to a kind of madness or suicide hmm. yeah 
Well, I have my opinion about that, but uh, <laughs> and and I would say I would say not that I the would... that the poems were for me the poems were a kind of liberation. Mm -hmm. But Mike, yeah, I was just going to say it. It uh, it's telling, I think, to go from Lowell, from a classicist, a poet's poet, into well, a more romantic and individual form rather than just picking up on that self-expression individual form <clears throat> a, and running with it and and taking yourself and your material so seriously that it ends up killing you like when he when he says what is what good is this sense of humor i think it's the humor actually that's saving him from the from the depths of the insanity and he he um he calls the Roman Catholic attendants uh, too little nonsensical. There's something about nonsense, the grasp that that the world is is nonsensical to a degree that that sort of holds him back. But again, I think it's important that you the underpinning of Lowell's classicism and his <clears throat> his craft work as a poet's poet to go into that sort of more dangerous territory of, of the self. I think it's what kept him. I don't know myself. I've never heard that Lowell was ever close to suicide. Um, I don't know. But it, it seems to me it is that, that sense of humor that he's questioning early in the poem that in fact really keeps him sane. He has some distance from things that some of the folks around him might not have and i think um that's that's the important thing i just my take on it so but it's it's a wonderful poem it's a great poem gail gail what's the what's the line in in bishop's elegy for lowell about humor always seemed to leave you at a loss we seem to leave you at a loss yeah. um and that's, I mean, that's such a complicated, oh, Catherine, did you? Well, one word comment. <clears throat> all, the, all the references of blue, isn't it interesting the color that contrasts that is not red, but crimson. Ah. That's, Harvard. that's Harvard. Okay, so yeah, crimson is the Harvard, is the yeah. official Harvard color. Yeah. Um, and I think Jim, and then Denise. Yes, please, Jim. Um, and and then Mary. And it's just Denise, an, and then Mary. Harvard reference. In fact, the place that uh, Lowell taught uh, Sylvia Plath and Ann, uh, Sexton was BU. Uh, right. And, uh, and so it's a fascinating cross reference at that point. Uh, the other thing that I think is is devastating is the the one couplet in the poem about the harpoon sparring for the kill, this is the home for the mentally ill. I mean, that's the capstone, I think, of the whole thing. Uh, and all the references to blue, I also hear as references to inside versus outside. You know, they're outside looking, inside looking out at the blue. Uh, and I, I agree, it's a depressive a reference to depression as well, but I do think it has to do with being, you know, locked away. Uh, so. mm -hmm. Right. Right. Um, uh, Denise and then Nick. And then Mike. Oh, Denise, you're muted. I thought I unmuted. There we go. This might be a bit of a backtrack, but there is a reference to the sea in each stanza. In the first, it's a harpoon, as if as though a harpoon were sparring for the kill, which maps onto the sperm whale, the most hunted whale. And then we've got two references to seals in the next stanza. And then, of course, there's the roly poly sperm whale in the fourth. And then in the fifth, there's Mayflower. There's the reference to the ship. And then in six, he's wearing a French sailor's jersey. So 
So this is a little thread that meanders through the whole poem. It makes the title more interesting. Oh, yeah. Yeah. The title is, the, the blue in the title is many leveled. Uh, many, yeah. Nick? Well, just uh, to say that uh, Lowell would certainly be, have been aware of Oscar Wilde's poem, uh, Ballad of Reading Jail, sure. which was, in fact, a protest against the conditions in the mental institutions of that day. And it refers to that patch of blue we prisoners call the sky. So I thought that that would be the same patch of blue uh, that uh, was all that these inmates could see through the window, azure blue, and it seems pretty straightforward, of course, also for the mood and, and depression, but just the sheer color. I took that literally as a beautiful blue sunny day, and yet it more it underlined it, you you that he, everybody is a, a, a prisoner in this in this place. Yes. Yeah. I I, 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 let me go back a, a, a little bit to talk about the, the, the or, you know, or, or to ask you to talk about the, the, the form of this poem, because one of the, really one of the, I think one of the great things about this poem and, and which was really kind of startling and shocking was the way it moves in and out of a traditional form. And Susan, you were sort of, you were really talking about this earlier and that the, the, the rhymes, when there are rhymes, they're always surprising. You really don't expect that. And I mean, you know, sophomore and corridor are rhymes but you don't really hear them that way. Mm -hmm. You see them that way on the page, but they're there. And there is this, I mean, the structure is kind of, I, I don't know, it's like, it's sort of skeletal. You know, it's this dangling skeleton where, where things are happening that are not part of the structure, but that there's this back, this kind of backbone of of traditional structure uh in the poem the you were talking earlier about the the the, the wonderful single line stanza which was not very common at the point that lowell was writing this this poem i mean everybody does it or every poet does it now but it's it it, it wasn't very common at the time and it's in and it's a blank it's a blank essentially a blank verse line an iambic pentameter line um and it's the this pull is it feels to me it feels it feels like there's this pull in the poem between having a structure having a form and then constantly breaking out of it or or being forced to break out of it. And that there's this kind of maybe internal uh, argument or battle within Lowell himself about using a form and then not being able to use the form and try and then using the form to 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 uh to keep himself to keep himself and the poem um uh together and that um i i find that one of the most moving and exciting things about the poem that it's always it's it seems to me it's always such a um it's odd to use the word joy <laughs> to, to to read this poem, but one of the real pleasures of the poem is the way Lowell, it seems to be so irregular, and yet Lowell is 
always in control of that. There's always this, the, 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 the spine in this, in this poem that's really, that's holding it together a, a, as a poem. Uh, <laughs> oh, Bill, would you, would you, would you read what you just, what, what you just wrote? Well, I noticed Bowditch Hall, and of course, Bowditch is another old New England name, and McLean was an old New England institution founded in 1811. But Nathaniel Bowditch, uh, and this is responding to Denise, Nathaniel Bowditch was the author, a mathematician, and the author of the American Practical Navigator. <laughs> uh, it's a chance, I mean, it's a found association. He right. was probably in Bowditch Hall, but. He was, yeah. Yeah, uh, Jennifer. Um, a small point about the form, the way that um, first rhyming couplet comes in so sharply at the end of the stanza, as though a harpoon was sparring for the kill. This is the house for the mentally ill. Um, it, I feel in that a kind of um, uh, implied equation between the work of the harpoon and the work of a couplet that both of those things you know you're you're targeted by it the form traps you um it, it's coming towards you where are you you couldn't be anywhere else but this and that's the harpoon pointing at you um this is the house for the mentally ill so i i guess that's sort of a vague point but it comes in as a conclusion that he'd like to escape but it's pointing right at him and I feel also then, because I keep thinking about this poem in terms of the beginning and ending, uh, some echo in that locked razor that isn't being used, like two lines of a couplet. You know, the couplet points the rhyme and then the rhyme comes in and it's sharp and it's cutting and you're trapped. Um, and and I, I don't want to make too tight an equation here, but I, I feel something something like that. Um, and then I just have one, one other question for you, Lloyd, about what you said about that line, these victorious figures of bravado, ossified, young. Um, to my ear, if it is a pentameter line, and I find that hard, I, it, it's a very crowded yes. line. Um, and, and maybe I would say the, the figures that he's describing are big figures crowded into small places, mm -hmm. yeah. all those things, the seals, the whales, everything that should be out in the blue ocean who are barely fit in these bathtubs. Um, mm -hmm. maybe there's a kind of um crowding of the ossified figures into a measure that's not it's not elegant it's awfully ungainly so is is that a home for them that kind of line anyway i just i just was surprised that's a way of saying i was i hear a, a measure to that line as if it were a blank you know an iambic pentameter line but but to me, yeah. it's still, it's not pentameter and it's not iambic. So. Well, it's definitely, pent I think it's definitely pentameter and it's sort of loosely iambic, but in, in, in a fairly traditional way. I mean, I think you'd find this, the da 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 that kind of five beat line, I think you'd find in Milton mm -hmm. uh, that it's not, it, it, it's really, it's, it's, five beats with a lot of variation going on around it but it, and i shouldn't have said iambic pentameter but it's 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 a it feels to me very strongly a pentameter line that's that moves away from the da 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 da, da, da but in a very traditional way that you would find a line with that with that rhythm in Keats or Wordsworth or or Shakespeare or 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 or, or Milton, and that uh, Catherine, you. Uh, no, I was just going to a corollary maybe to what Jennifer just said in the second to last line, 
Mm. We are all old timers. Yeah. That, that we're compelled. I mean, if it were music, there would, you know, it would all has to encompass three beats. It has to be tied across three beats. Yeah. We are, so it's, for, and it's the climax of the, we are all, I'm not different from, I'm not different from, we are all, and the insufficiency of syllables sort of forces us to land on that. We are all old timers. What I want to, I want to pick up on that. Oh, okay. I, 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 and, and how far can we push the word all? How inclusive is, is all? Mm -hmm. I mean, do you see what I'm asking? Yeah. What, what I'm leading, what I'm leading to. Are you, are you talking about us all yeah. the time? <laughs> Yeah. The readers, is he speaking also to the people who read or hear the poem? I I think so. Mm. Gail, yeah. I just want to say that even, even while we're talking about these lines, we haven't said anything about the wit of this poem, you know, that Lowell is... It's a very serious poem. He's also making fun of himself and his, his yeah. storm mates. Yeah. yeah. Well, and it, and and, 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 it's funny. and it it is sort of funny. Yeah. When it's about him, wasn't we, it? Oh. Uh, yeah. I, I was just going to say, Michael um, was saying. I think it was Mike who was saying that the sense of humor in the poem was really, you know, was was that what good is my sense of humor? And that was, that sense of humor is the thing that's kind of saving Lowell, that makes Lowell different from the, from the other mental patients, even though it doesn't, it doesn't exactly rescue him in terms of his depression. He's got a quality He's got a quality of sanity that these the 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 other um, you know professional professional thoroughbred <laughs> mental cases really don't have, yeah. and and um, I think that's so important in this poem. I think the the you know, one one of the things that I love about this poem, Sharon. I'm going to get to you in a second. One of the things that I love about this poem is that however many times I read it, it's so unpredictable and that Lowell is doing, you know, he, he, he already, he already has all the prizes just for his first book and that he's doing something so radically different in this book. Mm -hmm. And it was a tremendous, it was certainly a tremendous shock to the literary world. And that, and it really changed poetry. And it changed poetry, not just because, I mean, he didn't regard himself as a, as a confessional poet. I mean, he didn't like that term and he didn't think it was accurate or appropriate, but it started a whole sort of movement, but it also just tremendously liberated poetry in a way, you know, in a way that, you know, Walt, Walt Whitman liberated poetry, uh, maybe with lesser effect. And that Lowell, in fact, had a much bigger effect on the whole world of poetry, American poetry, certainly, after he wrote this, after he wrote this book. Sharon, um, what was your, your, yes, your, uh, hand, well, your hand is up. <laughs> yes, the, in the first stanza, um, and I'm struggling to understand the, the purpose and the work of the single word absence we start where it's a sleepy guy attendant is you know waking up after falling asleep and drooling on his book 
<laughs> and he's doing his slow, quiet, don't disturb. And then all of a sudden it's absence. My heart grows tense. And I just, I, there's this huge wake up and I don't know what it's about. Um, let me, let me say that th th there is a note in the collected Lowell on that word. And um, I mean, I didn't, I certainly didn't make the connection myself. And I, and I think maybe there are other things going on, but the note here is John Crow Ransom, winter remembered. And the quote is, so that's, from, that's a poem by, by John Crow Ransom, whom Lowell knew, a cry of absence, absence in the heart. So I don't, again, I mean, the person who wrote that note was, Karen, just a second. Yeah, I, uh, uh, the person who wrote that note thought that that was what the reference was or is suggesting that that was what the reference was. Okay. Um, but uh, I, I'll get, I'll get back to that. But Karen, what were you going to say? Well, a couple of things uh, on absence. I mean, he wanders in all kinds of language in this poem. So what strikes me is simply the, the old saying, absence makes the heart grow fonder. Sure. But it doesn't make the heart grow fonder, it's his heart grows tense. Mm. So mm. he's playing with, you know, rever reversing a, a trite statement, absence makes the heart grow fonder. But I wanted to return to what you were talking about paying some careful attention to uh, stress and how he uses stress in this mm. poem. At the end of the first paragraph, my question is why is the final line in parentheses? Maybe he intended to take it out. Uh, maybe it's a question about whether it should be in there or not. But if you look at the prosody of it, the way he has used the stress, the first word this is very demanding and then he moves into anapests that are a tripling rhythm da, 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 da. it's very dancey mm -hmm. the, uh, the uh anapestic rhythm uh da, 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 so da, da, da. Yeah. this is the house for the mentally ill so you've got a line that has these strong stresses on the first word and the last one. I I I want to I want to say um, that that dance rhythm is to me is is a kind of I think it's a kind of sing song rhythm, and this is go this goes back to to Ted's question at the very beginning uh, that it's a kind of nursery rhyme, mm. and that. Of course, with tremendous irony because of what it's. Yeah. Yes, Jennifer. Exactly. This is the house of Bedlam. Ted asked at the very beginning. Uh, Robin, we'll I'll get to you in a second. Uh, about um, he said some of this reminded him or or made him think about Elizabeth Bishop, uh, and. Um, Elizabeth Bishop's one poem directly about mental illness is is the her poem about um, visiting Lowell, uh, visiting Lowell, uh, visiting Pound in the mental hospital, mm -hmm. and in that poem, that the structure of that poem is this is the house that Jack built. Oh. So she actually, I mean, Waking in the Blue came significantly before, uh, before, uh, before Bishop's poem. Uh, but she certainly knew this poem. And um, I think, um, 
I, I don't know about deliberate echoes, but but um, visits to St. Elizabeth's is again, it, it, it seems to me so connected to this poem mm -hmm. and in Bishop's poem, she's only visiting mm -hmm. and Lowell here is on the inside, but he's both, he's both, he sees it on the inside and he also sees it from the outside. Mm -hmm. And I think that's one of the things that's so extraordinary about about this poem. Robin. I didn't have my hand up. Oh. It wasn't me. Okay, it's still up. <laughs> I see I see this hand on your well, oh I uh, oh well, no, it's my. I'm sorry, <laughs> my pointer. No, I, uh, yeah. Apologies. Susan does have yes, her hand please. up, though. Yeah, Susan and then Kathy. Yeah. While you, as long as you're on this line, why the apostrophe around mentally ill? Oh, well, I, I don't know. What do you, what, what do you think? Well, I, it, it just, I think that's a good, I think it's a good question. It's sort of, it's it distances a little. Any any like any thoughts the about category? It? I don't know. Yeah, I mean, but, yeah, out. category category is. I think you're is on the right track, Mary. Oh, you're muted, Mary. Oh my gosh, I just did a total space out because suddenly my hand appeared. You okay. know what? I'm so sorry. No, move, I forgot yeah, what move. what did you just said? Oh gosh. Why is mentally ill in Yeah, Portland? right, right, right. Sorry, sorry. I got totally lost there for a second. Um, oh yeah, I think it calls into question what men, what is mental illness? Mm -hmm. it, it it calls the whole concept into question, those quotation marks, I think. Sorry. Yeah, and that you know that 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 that's the sort of category it's been Jonathan. Your, it's definitely it's, your hand. <laughs> thank you. Yes, it is. <laughs> the the uh, to me is he's being euphemistic that there's some somewhat nastier uh, phrase that he might have put in there, and he decides to call it the mentally ill. Mm -hmm. um, I, I don't know if that's accurate for the period, but that's how I read it. Well, I think there's just tremendous irony in 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 mm -hmm. that in that easy summation. Uh, John, uh, uh, Jim? Oh, you're muted? Still muted, Jim. All right. There it goes. Can you hear me? Uh, yeah. I just wanted to make a comment about the other line that's also in uh, parenthesis. There are no Mo Mayflower screwballs in the Catholic Church. <laughs> so that's the other reference to the mentally ill. Uh, and the same, I think, uh, uh, powerful irony that you see there. Uh. Right. Question, what is the implication or the uh, in tone for putting parentheses? Oh, I'm sorry, you're, 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 you're breaking up so I can't hear the whole question. Oh, I'm sorry. Uh, I said, I have a question. What is the implication poetically of... Um, Parentheses. Uh, I would say, and and feel anyone feel free to to add to this. Um, that um, um, it's a it's an it, it's a, it's a kind of aside, mm -hmm. and that it's it's a it's a it's a kind of tonal tonal shift. Um, and that maybe there's even a kind of intimacy in um, speaking to the reader in that way that, uh, you know, in some ways he's, th th this is, this is, the poem is directed to the world 
but that in these parentheses, it's as if we're, we, the reader, are, you know, the, the friend that he's talking to, and he's he can he's freer to be ironic or or I I don't know I just hear I just hear a kind of a tonal shift and that what's so that's what's really important one of the things that's really important in this poem as in the other poems in this whole book is that the language is suddenly really more conversational than poetic language was before life studies certainly his his own poetic language but you know i mean he, wordsworth was really trying to use you know his the the, the 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 language that was spoken and it, it was it was a radical change but it wasn't it seems to me it wasn't as radical as what lowell was doing um I'd like uh, to add to that in the notes is that parentheses are another, maybe another voice, hmm. um, uh, an intrusive thought. Sure. And yeah. or the opposite of something ironized as an extra level. This was David um, adding to what you were just saying. Good. Yeah. Well, I think that's right. I think that's right. Uh yeah, <laughs> thank you, Mike. Uh, Dante wrote in Italian rather than Latin. John. Yeah, I've always thought that that line, um, this is the house, that it was a kind of aside from him stating that he couldn't believe he was in this place. And that there was a sense of ir irony there and a sense of humor. And every there are three instances of parentheses, and all of them are really ironic and snide in some way. And so that is him standing outside of the place, looking in at himself, I mm. thought. Mm. But uh, what I really wanted to say was the thing about absence is that I looked at uh, Ian Hamilton's biography of Robert Lowell that came out in the, in the 80s. And there is a first draft of this poem in there, mm. which was supposedly written while Lowell was in McLean's. Mm -hmm. And I've always wanted to find out, you know, when he wrote this, before, in this place, or afterwards. I think he rewrote it afterwards. But yeah. there's, and it's a beautiful example of editing with a scalpel. Because there are a lot of references to a student he was sort of interested in back then. I think it was, her name was Annie Alden. Mm -hmm. And all of those lines are removed. Yeah. And so much of the finished poem is in the original draft, but it's just sharpened. Okay. Oh. And the thing, uh, one of the things is that after he was let out of this, I think on a visit to go home to visit his wife, Elizabeth Hardwick, he had a daughter. And he wrote a poem about that, about shaving, and his daughter is putting shaving cream on his face. Yeah. And he's using a real razor. Yeah. Oh, and he's wonderful. being trusted with this. And this is contemporary while he was also an inmate there. He was just let out for the weekend. And so these two things are going on at the same time. And I think absence has a lot to do with just him missing his family. Sure. I think that's right. Yeah. And it's wonderful. And that's another, that poem is one, also wonderful, the, yeah. the, the other one. Bill, could you just say out loud what you, what you were writing in the, in the, in the chat, Bill Bennett. About what? <laughs> oh, I don't know. The, what, what What were the last two things that you posted? I thought I, they go by so quickly, and they I'm seem very, oh, I'm, oh, about. I just thought the parenthesis was Lowell turning to the audience. There, yeah. the beginning is a kind of rumination. It's internal, interior to him, and it doesn't really make clear uh, what institution he's in. We all know now we're. We're, we're sophisticated, but um, but he turns uh, and speaks through the fourth wall right. to the audience. In yeah, case I you didn't that, know, that yeah. this is where it's going on. Right. And um, but he he uses the parentheses again 
about the Mayflower and the Catholic Church. Yeah. Um, and, while, and while I'm allowed the, uh, a moment on the floor, the term mental illness uh, was coming into vogue uh, by the 1950s. It really doesn't appear much before 1930. Hmm. Uh, and there's been a, an effort to grope for some kind of language to um, euphemize psychosis hmm. or, which is never used, craziness, Crazy. madness, whatever. And that's shifted now, actually, so that it's faintly inappropriate to say mental illness. One says mental health problems. Uh, <laughs> read the newspapers all the time. Yeah. Uh, I had a- the Trouble is that the connotations come running after them. You know, now you say, oh, you're sick. You know, that was meant to protect someone. <laughs> uh -huh. But, but we, we don't talk about mental illness as much as uh, mental health difficulties or whatever now. And mental illness was just part of that process. And you may be ironizing that. I think so. I, I seems to me there's tremendous irony in 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 in, the, in those asides, um, and um, yeah, I know um, there's a lot of quotes. And then Robin actually has okay. uh, her hand raised. All right, Robin, we we we're we're almost out of time. I, we are actually out of time, but I just wanted to say that the very rhythmic line. This is the way day breaks in Bowditch Hall comes exactly at the middle of the poem. There are 25 lines before it and 25 mm. lines after mm. it. Um, yeah, and we we hardly talked about alliteration in the, in this poem, but uh, there's so much going on. Um, and any any last words we have to let Marita go. Um, uh, I I think this was a, a fascinating and surprising discussion in 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 many ways. And and um, I I loved uh, I loved hearing all the different directions that 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 you were coming from and thinking that this is um that this poem this really extraordinary poem um which in some way i i take for granted as i mean it's a kind of landmark in modern american poet quote unquote modern american poetry or even quote landmark in modern american poetry <laughs> that it can still arouse so much um, controversy and so many questions and um, so many feelings and so much feeling. And that's really, um, it's, it's what I was hoping for. <laughs> uh, 